Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It is good to be together, for we know that this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We're grateful for those of you who are joining us online this morning as well. There are three big announcements in your worship guide today, and two of them require, well, actually all of them, all of them require your signing up to help. So our big spring fest with animals and such petting zoo that's all going to be behind, you know, in the back, back here. Um, and I hope y'all have, have seen the sign out front that says, sit with a turkey, pet a pig. Those, those kind, that's what's going to be happening here on Saturday. But we need your help. So there is a, as a sign-up board just outside the sanctuary. If you haven't already volunteered to help, please do. I think that also you got an email that we need four cornhole boards, boards, four sets, four sets, if anybody has one, that we can borrow for that day, that would be awesome. There is also an event that uh, our health and wellness team is sponsoring on Friday, April the 19th. Please read that. Um, it's connected with Clemson University and also um, help to, to help us know how to protect ourselves from scams, which we all know uh, it's, it seems to be a daily, uh, a daily event. And then also on the 27th, that's also a Saturday, so in two weeks, that Saturday, Labor of Love is a mission blitz at the South Main Mercy Center. I am so excited about this possibility because we all have the opportunity to work alongside each other for the benefit of a wonderful helping mission in our community. If you haven't already signed up for that, please do. Now, I'm not going to say that if you don't show up on that day without having signed up that we won't have something for you to do, because we probably will. But it will help us know what we can accomplish that day if you sign up. And so now, let us turn our attention to worship on this beautiful, glorious day. For we know that God is here. God is present with us and among us and within us. And God has a word for each of us today.
now I invite you to stand as we offer songs of praise. Alleluia. that are called to praise. Happy Easter season. Today is the first day of the week. The joy of Easter still sings in our hearts. Breathe the breath of new life in your spirits. We open our hearts to all the wondrous work God has done to you. Welcome to worship this glorious day. Let our lives be testimony to God's redeeming love. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. 
where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you to the feet of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. We now turn our attention to prayers. And I invite you to look on the back of your bulletin. Those for whom we're praying. Angie Watts' brother is going to be undergoing some, some some serious surgery, April 12th and 13th. His name is Jerry Hoffman, so we want to keep him in our prayers. And then also, Cece Hansen is recovering from a fall. And Portia Hudson, I talked to, texted with Portia at the end of the week, and she said, five more, five more. And that's reason to say woohoo for sure. Um, Sheila Schrader, still recovering, still in that sling, will be for a while, but doing well, doing well. And then, of course, we always remember Cody Stovall. And then Violet Rhodes is continuing to wait for that phone call about surgery. So, so keep Violet in your prayers. Maria, we've been remembering you this week, too. A little bit of food poisoning, I understand. But the smile is big enough to say that she's doing just fine. So how grateful we are that as God's people, we can go to God in prayer. So let us pray together. God of grace, on this beautiful day, we thank you for the opportunity to worship, to be together as a family of faith. For, again, for we know that it is right here that we meet you and we meet you in each other. What a great privilege that you are willing to inhabit us that we can become your servants 
to do your good work in the world. It's a lifelong journey, Lord, we know. And we ask that you continue to enlarge our hearts, that our love might be representative of your love, that our grace may flow as freely as yours does. Lord, today we, we lift up so many in prayer, and we know that already you've been at work for good in their lives and for their health and for their healing. We know that's always your intention to make us whole. And so we just give a thank you from the depths of our hearts for that. We know that this connection in prayer is powerful, not just to you, but also in each other. So we pray, always we pray, even as you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as we sing together a song that is representative of the truth. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. that already you've done what I often forget to tell you to do or ask you to do, and that is pass these fellowship pads. But do it quickly, because I want you to listen. Because <laughs> here we are, right after Easter. Our worship last week was so full of joy as as we celebrated the centerpiece of our story, the affirmation that God always brings light and life out of darkness and death. We celebrated baptisms. We said once and again, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And yet, we know that we live in a world of high anxiety where our struggles with fear and worry and stress regularly strip away our joy. In fact, last night, just before I went to bed, I googled the word fear, knowing that I was going to be talking about this this morning. I googled the word fear, and over two billion websites came up in a 45th of a second. That's a lot of fear. And the news media friends 
so often their intention is to strike fear within us. Fear can strip away our joy, can paralyze us, even cause us to do awful things. And this frenetic fearfulness is not God's hope for our lives. So hear these words of Holy Scripture. First from Psalms and then Isaiah. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? And then from Isaiah. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and do not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. These are words of Holy Scripture. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And so for the next six weeks, I am inviting you on a journey as together we take a look at some of the things that make us afraid and how we, as people of faith and courage and hope, how we can live that way as people of faith and courage and hope, even though our fears often weigh heavily upon us. So in these next six weeks, just like we've done this morning, we're going to be claiming some scripture that will help us to live with less worry and more peace, less fear, and more hope. So, it seems like on a day like today, I should lead with the obvious question. What are you afraid of? Now, I'm literally asking you that question. So, shout it out. What are you afraid of? Nothing. <laughs> Mark says nothing. Anybody else? What are you afraid of? Changes? Changes. What? Illness. What else? Prejudice. What else? Loneliness. Old age. <laughs> she says with the voice of confidence. What else? Hatred. Oh, one more time. Space? Is it snakes? Snakes? Exactly, snakes. One of the things I'm afraid of is oversleeping my alarm on a Sunday morning. Or walking into this pulpit and my iPad dying. Now, you know that happened once. <laughs> so it's all the more fearful for me. On Sunday morning, I want this thing charged to 100%. Not 92%, 100%. But I'm going to tell you something. You and I both know that we only called out the fears that we think are acceptable to say in public. The ones that... We don't mind other people hearing. The ones that don't reveal just how vulnerable fear really makes us feel. Fear has been a part of the human experience since the dawn of time. It is deeply ingrained in our primal instincts. It's a powerful and complex emotion that can both protect us, but also it can paralyze us. 
It influences our thoughts and our actions and our decisions in profound ways. It shapes who we are. Several years ago, Abby and I, my daughter and I, visited Ireland, and it's a country that's full of these fortress castles. In their ancient days, you laid claim to some land, and you built a fortress around it to protect it. Fear of somebody taking your land, fear of somebody taking your life, it shaped their history, and it shapes ours. Now, fear has also driven some people to achieve great things, but it's also held others in its grip, stifling potential, diminishing progress, Exploring the nature of fear reveals a myriad of psychological, sociological, physiological implications. It offers us a window into the human condition itself. I've been grateful to author and pastor Adam Hamilton for his work on this topic which has helped me to shape this series. About fear, he writes, we can hardly overstate the extent to which worry, anxiety, and fear permeate our lives. We worry about the future, about politics, about our health. We fear violent crime racial divisions, the future of our economy. Deep rifts in our nation leave us with an increasing sense of uncertainty. Fear in the financial markets can wipe out billions of dollars of wealth in a single day. Our fears in the form of insecurity often wreak havoc on our lives and also on our personal relationships. Are you feeling the anxiety already? <laughs> Before we look any further at our fear on steroids, let's remember that fear is deeply ingrained into our primal instincts. We often perceive fear as a negative emotion, but it plays a crucial role in our survival, in our growth. It alerts us to potential dangers. It triggers the body's fight or flight response. So fear serves as a built-in defense mechanism. It's a gift. It's a gift from God. It helps us to assess risk. It helps us make quick decisions in threatening situations. It's why we're still alive on the planet. Long ago, when I was in youth ministry, I'd have a martial arts instructor come in and teach self-defense to my young people. And before he ever taught them how to break a hold or to poke an attacker's eye, he would talk to them about fear and the gift that it is to us. He would tell them, if you're walking down a street at night and something ahead of you, whatever it is, if something ahead of you causes the hairs on the back of your neck to stand up, turn around. Get out of there. That's your first defense. An internal alarm is going off in your body, and you need to listen to it and respond. Fear is a gift. From God. So far as many times as we hear do not fear in the Bible, it is hardwired into us. Our former district superintendent, Susan Leonard, she's also done a set of, seri a set of sermons on this topic. And I'm going to credit her for inspiring the first part of the title of our series. Fear less. 
for she acknowledged that it's impossible for us to live without fear. We can't do it. We can't be fearless, though I know there's probably some of you young people out there who think that's still a possibility. But trust me on this one. It's not. We can't be fearless. But by the witness of faith, we can live with less fear. And when we can lessen the fear, we can make more room for hope. The hope that we find in God, the hope that we find in each other. So fear less, hope more. So now back just for a moment to our fear on steroids. We've named that fear's hardwired into us, that God gifted us with it to keep us from harm. But we live in a world today that seeks to capitalize on our fears, to monetize our fears, to exaggerate our fears, to strike fear within us when there is no need for fear at all. And sometimes those fears get out of control, even within our own bodies. Fear becomes harmful instead of helpful. And we experience that personally. And I think we're also experiencing it as a society as well. We get stuck in a cycle of fear or worry or anxiety or whatever you want to call it. And our hearts race and everything seems overwhelming and we struggle to make it stop. Think about it this way. We all have smoke detectors in our homes. They're there for a good purpose. They alert us to potential danger. When the grease gets too hot in the pan or a circuit should overheat or heaven forbid we've left a candle unattended and smoke begins to fill the house then that smoke detector goes off and it's going to save us. But sometimes there's a faulty sensor. Have you ever been sound asleep and you hear that little chirp? <laughs> Absolutely. You know what it is. And you hope that maybe you can just go back to sleep right? But that's a persistent little chirp. <laughs> and you can't go to sleep, and so you know you've got to get up and do something. You've got to deal with it. And before you can drag your foggy brain self out of the bed, you know that dealing with it is going to require a ladder. Now, if you have low ceilings in your house, all it's going to take is a step ladder out of the closet. But if you have high ceilings, you know you're headed out to the garage to get a tall ladder. You also know that they have never made those things with a battery that's easy to get out. <laughs> and nowadays, they're all hardwired in together. So you got, you know, this chorus of chirping going on in your house. And now you're on the top of that step ladder or that big ladder, and you're certain now that you're never getting back to sleep tonight. And if you're like me, you think, well, I'll just rip this thing out of the wall, <laughs> and we'll deal with it tomorrow. <laughs> Somehow, the contacts have gotten some dust on them, or a wire has come loose, or a sensor is faulty. You can't make it stop. Something that was built for good sounds an alarm when there is no smoke. And sometimes that's what our bodies do as well. Have you been stuck in that loop of anxiety or fear or worry and you think, I just got to quit thinking about this. I can't think about this anymore. And then that makes it worse. 
especially at night, and you just can't get to sleep. There's no smoke, but the alarm is going off. Sometimes the system needs a reset, some tools for dealing with it. For so much of the time, our fears are exaggerated and will never happen. That's what we're going to be exploring for the next several weeks in worship. Because, according to the witness of Scripture, this is not the life that God intends for us. I think I've told you this parable before. It's an old Cherokee tale. It's about good and evil, but I think it easily applies to hope and fear. The story's about a boy and his grandfather. The old man wanting to pass on some wisdom, he tells the boy, a fight's going on inside me, a fight between two wolves. One wolf is fear, the wolf that will cripple my life with anger and despair and resentment, he said. The other wolf is hope, bringing the potential of joy and peace and love and humility and kindness and faith. The old man looked at the boy and said, the same fight is going on within you, grandson, and inside every other person on the face of this earth. And the boy pondered for just a moment. And then he asked his grandfather, which wolf will win? And the old Cherokee looked at his grandson and said, the one that you feed. The one that you feed. One of the ways that we nourish the hope within us is right here at God's table. It's right here. It's right here that we hear the scriptures that remind us of the stories of our faith that remind us of the sacrificial love that is right at the very heart of our story, that remind us of the grace that we have been given in God through Christ and the hope that we find right here. And so now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I invite you to stand. As together, we feed hope right here at the table of grace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us a way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. 
By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. Once we were no people, and now we are your people. Declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and he gave thanks to you and he broke the bread saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And as often as you drink from it, remember me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples. In the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as praise and thanksgiving, as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here, and on these good gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by this great love. By your Spirit, make us one with each other and one in ministry to the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite our communion servers to come forward. And as they do, let me remind you that this is God's table. It's not our table. It's God's table. And all who are following after the ways of Jesus are welcome right here. So if this is your first time to be worshiping among us, you are welcome right here at God's table of grace. It is our tradition to come and kneel at the rail. We kneel with extended hands as bread is placed into your hands because grace is always given, never taken. As you receive bread, you may partake. The cup will follow just after. And after you have partaken of bread and cup, you may return to your seats. We also allow the choir to come down and receive first. But I'm going to invite those of you who are on this side to go ahead and come this way because I think that there will be room. How good it is on this Sunday after Easter to be fed, to be nourished for this journey from God's table. The feast is ready.
my sister, the body of Christ, get it for you. Ray, my sister, the body of Christ, get it for you. Michael, my brother, the body of Christ, get it for you. Body of Christ, given for you. Tell me your name. Maria. 
Will you join me in prayer? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we, may by, that we, by the power of your Holy Spirit, may go out into this world to give ourselves to others. Amen. Will you stand as we sing our closing hymn together? And I always feel like this one is one of those that's necessary for you to just reach out and grab the hand of the person next to you. And I'm going to give you permission at this moment to cross the aisle if you need to. Um, we'll just part the way when I'm ready to offer the benediction, all right? Let's sing together.
As you go into the week, I want you to know that on Monday, and you've probably read this already in your pulse, but on Monday, we will release the first of a series of devotional podcasts recorded by our members right here in hopes of helping to feed your hope. Yes? As you tune in, listen for grace. In fact, that's what we're calling the podcast, Listening for Grace. Listen for grace. Grace that is the gift of being part of a family of faith, of being able to hold on to each other, to share concerns and cares and sorrows and joy. A family of faith that is representative of the steadfast love of God, the consistent hope of the Lord that is available to each one of us in God, and in each other. So now we go knowing that Christ goes before us to plan and prepare the way. That Christ comes beside us, friend and companion, on this long and often difficult journey. That Christ comes behind us to finish all the things that we have to leave undone. That Christ is within us, giving us everything that we need. Hope. But most of all, Christ is above us, calling us forward, reconciling our lives, now and forever. Amen. Amen.